Old School Lane Casual Chats is brought to you by OldSchoolLane.blogspot.com and is associated with ManicExpression.com, TheComicBookCast.com, The Reopen Nickelodeon Studios in Orlando, Florida Facebook page, and the PlayStation YouTube channel. Welcome aboard to this week's episode of Casual Chats. As usual, I am Patricia, and I am here with three guests, two of which are from Manic Expression. They are Jim Beaven. Uh, actually, it's Bevan, but I'll forgive you since this is since I'm still relatively new to this. Oh right, um, very sorry. We're still kind of no problem. It, just remember the just remember by this simple mnemonic: Jim Bevan gives all the ladies a taste of heaven. <laughs> that's a that's actually a pretty good one. Thank you. And uh, also none other uh, than uh, Alex the D. Hi, and my brother Nick. And Hello. his brother Nick. Hi, Doctor Nick. Hello, everybody. Uh, so today's episode is going to be dedicating to the adventures of Pete and Pete. On November 28th, uh, 1993, The Adventures of Pete and Pete debuted on TV. Originally, they were shorts that featured in in 1989, but as the series uh, became more popular due to its shorts, they decided to have its own TV series. So three seasons later, being canceled in 1996, it has gained, even to this day, a huge following. So would you guys like to talk about how you guys got introduced to the show? Well... We watched Nickelodeon a lot growing up, and, you know, that was one of the shows that was on there a lot, so, and it was definitely one of the more standout shows, for reasons I'm sure we'll discuss, and, you know, it just stood out among the crowd for that reason, so that's how we got into it. And when did you first got introduced to the show? Well, because it was on when I was, I was really young when I, when it was first on uh, so it's hard to pinpoint exactly when I got into it. I do vaguely remember some of the second season episodes, such as um, Artie's last episode. I vaguely remember watching those as they were new. So I do know I was at least, I would estimate around that time is when I really got into it. Okay. Uh, would you say the same thing, Nick? Yeah, uh... Oh, how old were we? Probably like seven or five? That's probably when it first went on the air. Yeah, I definitely remember seeing the shorts. Like being first introduced to the shorts. It appeared during other TV shows at the time. I, I actually don't remember seeing the shorts when they were new. But by, by the time, like I said, by the time I got into it, it was a full fledged show. Yeah, uh, they were really, they were really weird. Uh, I'm trying to think of one that like stood out in my mind, but. Like, I don't know, they were just like, real, like, even for like the show standards, the shorts were kind of farther out there. Yeah, the one that sticks out for me, and it's one that I don't remember ever seeing growing up, I didn't see it until I got the second season DVD, is when Pete, the way Big Pete Hello. is the, gets the job mowing the lawn across the highway, and Little Pete gets a job as a stockbroker. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll change it. I'll change that, it. Yeah, that was kind of, that was really just amusing just to see. When that, when you saw that, you saw, you got a good indication of the direction the writers wanted to take the show, you know, they weren't going to keep it constrained like the Wonder Years, they were going to, they were going to have, have fun and push limits. So Kevin, uh, we were discussing about how we got introduced to Pete and Pete, uh, would you like to share your story? Uh, sure, no problem, uh, it was, well, I got into the show around the 90s, and uh, it was definitely on SNCC. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, I, there's two things I remember about Pete and Pete. It was the sh- well, actually, I'm sorry, three things: the show, Hardy, and a lot of like collective soul. Um, it was this band in the '90s, and they had like two songs, which. Um, Sorry, I'm a little unprepared. I'm trying to find the, uh, I can't find the album. There were these two songs that they had, and it reminded me so much of Pete and Pete. And I just, you know, it was a lot different from, like, the other shows that Nickelodeon had, I guess because it was more comedic surreal. But to answer the question, that's really how I got into it. It was just, like, I watched it on TV, and I was just a big fan, and I just, I couldn't, I, I loved all the episodes, and... It was a nice break from watching the animated shows and then watching the live action shows. I mean, of course, you had Clarissa and all that, but I mean, this was just this. The humor, for some odd reason, all oh, the two songs, by the way, are "Shine" and "December." Especially "December" from Collective Soul. I always think of Pete and Pete. I don't know why. I really don't. And honestly, it was just it just it was a very '90s show, and it was just it, it was like it, it had real people, real things. I, I like that, that's how I really remember Pete and Pete. That's great, Kev. Yeah, um, thank you. As for me, I was first introduced to the show similar to Kevin. I first saw it on SNCC, and the first episode that I distinctly remember it was Day of the Dot. It was the episode. <laughs> it was the episode in which uh, they were in band class, and they had to basically perfect the word squid because that was their mascot, and Ellen was chosen to be the dot in the eye. And I just found it to be strange at first. I didn't really get much of an appreciation for Pete and Pete until around 2005 when I was in college and they started showing reruns on the end. That was when I started falling in love with the show. But I think is that's one of the things I've noticed watching it again. There's a lot of material that you see as a kid that you don't really comprehend until you're a little older. Definitely. And I think that's the, that's the quality of a good show. You know, because it's not just for kids. It can be enjoyed by anyone of any age. Definitely. Mm-hmm. Definitely. I so, agree with that 100%. Definitely. Mm-hmm. What would you guys say are some of your favorite episodes of Pete and Pete? The Call was is probably one of my favorites, or at least in the top three. Nice. I was going to say, it, you know, it has a standard premise of, you know, it starts off pretty silly. You know, everyone's going crazy in town because of this phone that keeps ringing. You have little Pete and his friends trying to go on this big epic adventure to solve the mystery. And then at the end, it's you know, there's actually this very touching moment about you know, unrequited love and desire and you know, how, the, what this, how the phone's symbolism changes now that people know what its true intention is. <laughs> I remember that episode. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's silly, but it's, it's touching, too. It is. That's that's the beauty of it. <laughs> um, Alex, what would you say is your favorite episodes of Pete and Pete? For for me, I would. Uh, it's it's kind of a it's kind of a sort of a three way tie between uh, Halloweeny, just for how cinematic it is, uh, Yellow Fever, just because I think it's just such a well written episode with how <laughs> you, you, after a while you begin to feel like the boiling point that every other character is coming to. But uh, the longest time, my favorite episode was 35 Hours, when Young Pete sells the house. Probably just because that episode has such a hilarious premise to it. Young Pete sells the house, and it's like the nicest family in the world. (laughs) Which is kind of ironic when you realize that the the wife in that family was Patty Hearst. I know, that is hilarious. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, and what, not to mention it has one of my favorite scenes from the entire series when Pete hires when Big Pete hires endless Mike to terrorize the family. He kicks it out the door. He's got this axe and just says, "Welcome to my nightmare." <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> They're like duck, duck, goose. Yeah, I, I remember distinctly about 35 hours. That was actually the first episode of season three, to be to say the yeah. least. Yeah. And to be quite honest, uh, we'll, be, we'll be discussing about season three later, but my favorite episode, well, this is actually really tough because um, Yellow Fever is definitely one of them. It's basically like a field trip gone horribly wrong. 
you know, with bus driver Stu, he's still upset about his girlfriend breaking up with him for, like, the umpteenth billion time. And also the fact that, you know, they got lost along the way, and Big Pete is acting like a jerk, and he's becoming the bully, which is usually not like his character. And he becomes uh, enemies with his best friend Ellen, but he becomes best friends with the enemy, which is Endless Mike. I was just going to say, it's a really impressive bottle episode, you know, and that was another thing that helped it stand out, because you never really saw too many episodes of kids' shows that really dealt with characters dealing with that level of tension being pushed to the breaking point. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, 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 please, please, if you have anything to say, please, you're welcome to. Oh, I agree, totally, because, like, see, that's why I love Pete and Pete, because, like, as I was saying before, you know, I was watching Doug and Rugrats, and Ren and Stimpy, I mean, of course, Ren and Stimpy, obviously, I mean, you can't really put that, that and Doug and Rugrats in the same category, and Clarissa explains it all. Granted, that was a live-action show, but it wasn't... I, I always thought, and, and you guys can correct me, or, you know, definitely feel free to, like, if you don't feel this way, but granted it was dark, it had... I mean, I'm sorry, granted it was funny, but there was a lot of dark moments in the show that was, like, dark funny. And I think that's what made the show what it is, is because it's, like, as kids, and as Jim easily pointed it out, you know, it's, you know, a lot of the stuff you're, like, as a kid, like, wow, I can't believe I'm watching this. Yeah. It's kind of like... I almost see a lot of parallels between it and Billy and Mandy, you know, not just for the dark humor, but also for the fact that, you know, it was basically set in this world where bizarre things happen every day, and yet everyone seems to take it in stride. Everyone has their own quirks, even the so-called, even the people who assume themselves to be sane. Yeah. Yeah. This is now. This isn't like a strange setting in a normal town, like say Erie, Indiana, or Twin Peaks. This is more like normal. Um, in fact, there was this one quote that I really liked from an article saying that the Adventures of Pete and Pete is the closest thing that of um, an independent film would ever reach on TV. Makes sense. Yeah, it definitely makes sense. I also, I also like you know, I mean, I, and I and to Alex and Jim and, and even Pat and. So all the viewers out there, I, I please do not get offended at what I'm about to say because this, you know, I don't mean this in a very nasty, rude way. But I love how it poked fun of the suburban lifestyle. And at the time, you know, afterwards, because it came out before Beavis, you know, there was Beavis and Button, and that poked fun of suburban life. And I just like how it was set in this suburban town, and it's like you had all these interesting, quirky characters. So I like how it was kind of like poking fun of that in a sense, you know, how, you know, when you think of suburbia, you think of like, at, at the time, not now, but at the time, you thought of like Leave it to Beaver, you thought of like, you know, Wholesome, Dennis the Menace, like 50s and stuff like that, and it was sort of in a way making fun of that in a way, but not in your face, it was like very discreetly. It strips away the artificial perception. Exactly, exactly, like I, I, I mean, I wasn't... I mean, I was just laughing, at, exactly, like, I was just laughing at, it's, at spoofing, in a, in a way, in a sense like that, because you had all these characters living in this town, um, and, uh, you know, each one had, like, a different personality, it was, like a, it was like a Smurf, in a sense, like, you know how the Smurfs did, it's like, Grumpy Smurf, Smurf that, Papa Smurf, Brainy Smurf, and all that, well, each character had, like, his own or her own backstory, or mini yeah, backstory, yeah. you know? Yeah, you had the obsessed math teacher. Yeah. You had uh, Ellen's Ellen's father, who was played by Steve Buscemi in perhaps one of his most restrained roles. And yeah. That's, you know, that's saying something because it was still quirky, but you look at Buscemi's other work. Yeah, I know, like Boardwalk Empire. Oh, uh, yeah. I actually, I hate to say, I have never seen an episode of Boardwalk Empire. Is it that people better? Neither have I. Yeah, I have a friend who's into it though. She names the raccoon that often comes into your yard. She named it Jimmy Darmati. Wow. Yeah, because he's always reaching for stuff he can't have. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, Alex, Jim, I got a question to ask you, and I also got one for Patty. Remember the episode in Pete Pete with the voodoo doll, Steve Buscemi? That was Apocalypse Pete. Yeah, that was the yeah. episode in which they were competing on this like um, neighborhood car race to see who would win and there was like this huge feud going on and uh, Ellen was making an action figure of her father and then the car pretty much exploded because little Pete sabotaged it and then they were keeping the doll in like this big 
Well, actually, it was like a lair in the basement. It was like l- looking like one of those lairs that you see in like uh, spy movies, like James Bond. Which, you know, to say the least, it was kind of weird. Yeah, that episode is actually one of the episodes from the pilot season, the one that's featured from ninety one to ninety three. I'm, I'm very. I know we're shifting gears, and I apologize. Well, this is called casual chats, Kevin. We can, you know. No, I'm just saying. I'm, I'm very upset that they still haven't released the third season of Peeing Pete. Pee. You know, it's very funny how it's collecting dust in the Par- in Paramount Studios vault. It's released. It's done. It's complete. And, you know, it's got. You know, the discs are ready. But for some odd reason, they're just not releasing them, and it's really, it's very frustrating that we still haven't got the third season, but we got all the other ones. I actually remember, I was, we went to the Slimed event, and we were talking, and I uh, said that to the actor who played the father, and he said to me, he goes, yeah, that's very upsetting, he said, because, you know, fans want, you know, they released the first two, but why not the third one, you know, so. A lot of Nickelodeon shows are on DVD now, like, I actually bought the complete series of odd real monsters while i was at walmart today oh i hate you i don't mean that in a bad way but i'm so jealous of i want that i want that <laughs> and it also kind of irks me because you have you have mediocrity like hey dude being released on dvd it's like come on they have every season of two and a half men out on dvd you think they could put some quality out there to balance it out i know and it kills me they, they're not even because, you know, Shout Factory uh, put out Our Real Monsters, and they're, like, they own the rights to, the, like, the past Nickelodeon shows. And I'm like, when are they going to release Doug and Rugrats and, like, you know, take over the rest of Clarissa Explains It All? And Actually, Doug and Rugrats are on DVD. Right? You're right. You're right. Yeah. I, was, I, I have the third season. It, it's what my brother got me for Christmas two years ago. Uh-huh. How's the quality on that? Is it good? Because I know it's the... It's pretty good. It's good? Oh. It's, it's bare bones, but that's fine with me. Hey, as long as you get dug on DVD, man, that I wouldn't... I'd, I'd be the same way. I'd be like, yeah, I'm happy either war. <laughs> I, I bought the Doug DVD yet for some reason. I, I believe that one of the episodes is missing from one of the seasons, and I don't oh, know why. Yeah. Uh, is this all the Doug episodes, or is it just the ones before it moved to Disney and they got rid of Billy West? It's Nickelodeon Doug. Ah, uh, okay. Well, that's good, because, let's be honest, Disney Doug wasn't really worth watching. Oh, no. I, I agree with that. I actually have a Doug doll. I'm sorry, I know this is Pete and Pete, but I gotta, I gotta say this, and, uh, I, this is the only Doug, I, I still have the Doug, my Doug doll, but it was, it's the Disney Doug, and I took it with me to the, uh, slime, the, the book signing, I'm a dork. I can't, you know. I'll admit yeah. that. And uh, I, and I and I love Doug, and that's like my all-time favorite Nickelodeon show. And I spoke to Vanessa Coffey, who was the creator of the Nicktoons block in that, and she said that there was supposed she has a prototype of the Doug of the Nickelodeon Doug that was supposed to come out. So I was a little upset they never released that. That never saw the, the light of day. But well, we're me and down because my brother had to go to band practice. Oh, that's too, that's too bad. Yeah. Oh. Uh, what instrument does he play? Uh, he... It's kind of hard to keep up, just because he actually hates instruments. I believe he's on bass now. Nice. Oh, nice. And uh, what's the name of his band? Oh, I don't remember. <laughs> I, hate, I know that's terrible, but... He, he actually does not talk about his band that much. Hmm. Which is odd because I always talk about because I always talk to him about my projects and stuff but he very rarely talks about his band oh wow so um, while we're on the subject of music the adventures of Pete and Pete is known for having an eclectic soundtrack they have various amounts of music from Polaris and Magnetic Fields and Sid Straw and Chud and Nice and Semi Gloss and a whole bunch of others Luscious Jackson. Luscious Jackson is another one. Yeah. I, think uh, can credit, I can credit Pete and Pete for basically getting me, uh, turning me into an alt-rock fan. Um, what would you say is the song that cemented you with that? I wouldn't, I can't really say it was one song. It was pretty much all the ones I heard. I just, I like the sound. And, you know, some episodes when I, when, and, when, and it was also, I guess you could attribute it to the guest stars they had too, you know, because... 
they managed to wrangle some big names in the music industry. They had Iggy Pop, they had Michael Stipe, they had Deborah Harry, and you know, when I saw these, I was still young. I didn't really know much about these people, so I asked my parents who they were, and they tell me, and they let me, you know, put it, turn me on to some of their songs, and I got into them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Not to mention that Polaris actually makes an appearance on the episode Hard Days Pete. Yeah. And that's the episode that everybody talks about. If oh, you're yeah. a fan of Pete and Pete, there is no denying that Hard Days Pete is going to be brought up even at least once. Yeah, um, I really like the soundtrack to that. I actually have it on my iPod. Oh, nice! And oh, that, wow! Uh, I have the I have the soundtrack on my uh, iPhone as well. Uh, that is all twelve songs sung by Polaris. Yeah, I actually looked up some of their other stuff when, before they became Polaris when they were still known as Miracle Legion. Yeah. It, it was pretty good, not as memorable as uh, not as memorable as what they did as Polaris for Pete and Pete. Uh, the one highlight for me and anybody who knows my taste in music me know this should know this was a big deal for me. They did a cover of Ziggy Stardust, which was a which was a big excitement for the David Bowie fan I am. Nice. And which episode was that from? <laughs> this, this was before. Uh, this was their Miracle Legion stuff, which was uh, the band they made, They were before they became Polaris and did songs for Pete and Pete. Oh, right. If you're a David Bowie fan, do you like? did you like the movie Labyrinth? I know that sounds a little cliche. Yes, yes, I do. I actually have a, uh, I have two figures still in the box of the Jareth figure. One is of Jareth, and the other one is with him and Hoggle. So I have two I have two David Bowie figures. So when you say you were a David Bowie fan, I was like, Oh, I should tell him I have two Labyrinth figures. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Yeah. You like any of the bands that were inspired by Bowie, like Bauhaus or Love and Rockets? I, I actually haven't listened to as much of that stuff. Uh, uh, just wanna I have the uh, I have the serious player online and I often listen to the classic alt stations so they play them oh, pretty nice. frequently. Oh yeah. I think what hey, as, you know, we have a radio at work too, but the stations that they pre programmed in are mostly if the uh, Pablum generic pop stuff, Train and Kelly Clarkson and Bruno Mars, so whenever they have those stations on, after I come back I gotta listen to the good stuff to wash it away. Right. Yeah. Oh that reminds I was when I was getting prepped for this episode, I found this article from uh, two years ago which says that the Adventures of Pete and Pete basically invented the modern day hipster. Oh yes, we're definitely we need to talk about that definitely because remember Kevin when we were at the book event and Matthew asked that very same question to Hardy and Michael who played as yeah. Big Pete and the dad. They said, "Did Pete and Pete created the modern hipster?" And they said, "Yes." You know, that's an interesting. Well, actually, I got to be honest with you, Patty. Go ahead. I'm not trying to be rude. Um. It was actually funny when you said that question because um, the father didn't seem he understood. I mean, I'm not making fun of him. It was just it was just funny, like because I remember there was a big laugh. The father didn't really understand the question, and Mike was kind of he- hesitant to answer that question when he was asked that. Like there was a big laugh. He was like, "Uh." <laughs> yeah. Uh, it had to be fun to see. That was because, like, when we went there, like um, uh, Michael came in his. Um, in his uh, uniform from just from work, and uh, the father, uh, Art, uh, what was his name again? Hardy. Uh, uh, Hardy. Oh, Hardy. No, I thought you were talking about the father. Yeah, the father. Yeah. He's played Hardy. by uh, Hardy Rawls. Hardy. He was. He was a great. He was so awesome. Like I know this is changing off topic, but he was such a nice guy to talk to, and he was he signed our books, and he was so friendly. Like he was just like a big teddy bear, and uh, you know, when Michael, when Matthew asked that question to them. Because they did a whole big, they had um, all the live action shows together. They had one person from Hey Dude, uh, two people from Nick Arcade, uh, Roundhouse, um, and they had you know a couple of other people. Surprisingly, the mother from Pete and Pete was supposed to be there. Mark Summers was calling for her twice, no, three times, and she didn't show up. So I don't know what happened. Everybody was getting nervous. They hoped she was okay, but I guess something happened the last minute. Yeah, oh, um, I I actually received a message from Matthew uh, after we were leaving the book event. He was saying that uh, Judy uh, Judy Grave, who played as the mom from Pete and Pete, there was like a family emergency and she couldn't make it uh, on, on the last minute. Oh, well, I hope everything is okay. But it was funny when Matthew asked him that question. 
I, I you know, I, I don't, I, I, it looked as if they didn't know how to answer that question, they didn't understand the question, but it was just their facial expressions, there was a long pause, like, Michael was like, uh, yeah, and then, and then, <laughs> Artie was like, uh, I guess, yeah. <laughs> That's the book of it. That was pretty funny. Now, I can un- I read the article, which was um, on MTV blog, and it said some actually interesting things about why they feel that the hypothesis that P and P created the modern hipster is true. One oh, of them. Stuff, no, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> One of them was that it takes place in you know this small suburban town, which. From what I read in an article talking about hipsters in 2011, a lot of the people who are quote-unquote modern-day hipsters are moving into suburban towns, some from Austin, Texas, and most notably around upstate New York, which is where Pete and Pete took place. Are you a hipster? Mm, I don't think so. I'm not a hipster, no. I I don't wear... I'm not a hipster. I'm a meta-hipster. I ironically like things, ironically. Yeah, me too. I don't know if I'm one either. I'm just, I'm just goofing around. I don't, I'm, you know, just asking. It's okay. Whether you are, I, whether people are or not, I, I just, you know, like, like to goof around. I like to joke around with Patty. Um, also, another thing that they mention about that Pete and Pete, you know, that the fact that the show was, uh, the, the show's main characters were two redheads, and redheads are a rarity as being the main stars of a TV show. And they weren't just redheads, they were daywalkers. That too. Also, I think another one was the clothes that they used to wear, like a lot of flannel clothes, which, you know, nowadays are apparently kind of popular. Also, the, the short pixie haircut that mom had on Pete and Pete. Another one that was really funny was Mr. Tasty's ice cream truck, which a lot of people say is like the modern day food truck, which in itself is not really so because there used to be a lot of ice cream trucks like around the 90s. Yeah, but it's like the fads picked up now because you have people yeah. selling all different things from food trucks. I went to college in Philadelphia, and I'd see so many of those trucks out every day, some selling standard stuff like hot dogs and burgers, some selling Indian food, some selling Chinese food. Never went to them myself, though, because the big problem with those food trucks is you never really know what the sanitation levels are. That is true. Like, I walked by so many that I could visibly see flies buzzing around through the window. I think another reason why they called the show the that created the modern hipster was because when you have to consider that this was actually a show for teenagers and kids, it had a lot of songs that you would not hear on the radio, like mainstream. There were basically independent rock singers and pop stars. You know, only like the hardcore music fans would be able to know who the, most of these people are. So I think that's why um, a, a bigger appreciation to this kind of music is also another key to why many people say that it created the modern hipster. So as the general tone, too, as well, there's, there's always an underlying theme of rebelling against authority or social constraints. Yeah, I think two examples are of that is from two episodes. One of them is X equals Y. And another one is, I think, maybe the Nightcrawlers. X equals Y is basically the episode in which Ellen questions uh, the math teacher, Miss Fingerwood, on why algebra even matters. And none of the other teachers can be able to answer the question on why. And then the Nightcrawlers is when Little Pete does not want to go to bed on time. And he, in order for him to stay up, he decides to break the world record of staying up for 11 nights. Not to mention that there was an episode that featured a small little um, group called the International Adult Conspiracy. Basically a bunch of grown-ups who want to control their kids and tell them what to do. Kids Next Door ripped that off. Yes, Kids Next Door definitely ripped that off. That, that is a good example of how Pete and Pete was ahead of its time. The whole, the, the whole thing about adults you know, talking to the other adults about how to feed their kids broccoli or how to make them do homework or something like that. That is definitely something that Kids Next Door was inspired by. Yeah, you talked about the Nightcrawlers episode. The one I remember from that episode was the dad talking about how he snuck in 2% milk, which, to be honest, I never understood because I like 2% milk. Yeah. Where the planet are you from? Um, I think the reason why is because if you compare two percent milk to whole milk, I think that two percent milk, since it's, um, you know, it removes most of the fat out of the the dairy. I think maybe it has like a watery taste for for some people. Who, act, honestly, much, much more bland, oh. yeah. Yeah, much more bland. That is very inquisitive of you. I had no idea. I just blew your mind, Kevin. You just blew my mind, Patty. Oh my god. 
Uh, X equals Y, when I was rewatching that, I again noticed kind of another thing that flew over my head when I was a kid. You know, when you watch it at first, it seems to be setting up that he whole, you know, both sides of the argument have a valid point thing. You know, kids should understand the teachers. The teachers should try to relate better to the kids. But you look at it now and you see, you know, it's kind of, it kind of makes the point where you kind of have to, it's, ain't, it's okay to question authority, just know why you're questioning authority because the thing you're rebelling against, it might actually be valid. Right. You know, at yeah, first, Ellen doesn't really see the purpose to word problems in algebra, but by the end, she sees that they can be useful in various aspects, provided that they're made concrete and not kept abstract. So I guess the, like I said, the, premise, the premise they're trying to get is, you know, be willing to question just make sure you know why you're questioning because you never know if what you're rebelling against is useful or not. Insert Obamacare joke here. Oh, ouch. <laughs> the, the, Getting controversial the, the, here. The thing I find funny in that episode is the fact that the cooking teacher is actually played by Toby Huss. Yes, it was. I was that as a kid. You know who else Toby Huss played in uh, Pete and Pete? He played a... Was I... He played another part? Yeah, he was Mr. Part? Tasty in The Mask. Oh, yeah! Wow. And you never saw the cooking teacher and Mr. Tasty in the same place. Yes, that's right. Now, when it talks about season uh, three, for example, a lot of people have debates on whether season three is as good as seasons one and two because um, a lot of the episodes from season three focus more on Little Pete and his best friend Nona, and this is when Artie was gone. And Big Pete and Ellen were, like, pushing the sidelines. And this is when it had more of a kid tone. This is The reason why it is the way it is is because the network felt that season two was a little bit too strange and risque. So that... Too strange and Adventures of Pete and Pete episode? I'm sorry to cut you off, Patty. I was just... I know it's an un- I know it's the understatement of the century, but... You yeah, have- no, see, because that's the main the show, but... And that's funny coming from Nickelodeon, of all people. I mean, they had Ren and Stimpy, and that show was far more strange than Pete and Pete. I mean, I love Ren and Stimpy, don't get me wrong, but, like, you know, how can you say Pete and Pete was strange? I mean, uh... Well, let, let, let me put it to you this way. If you look back on the pilot season and season one, even though it has a nice quirky tone, it's very simple. It's season two that is the most strangest out of all of them. I mean, you know, the first episode of season two has little Pete when he's grounded. I mean, what does he do? Most kids would just stay in their room, but no. He decides to go and run away by digging a tunnel from his garage to the next door neighbor's house. Just because he couldn't see the fireworks on 4th of July. Uh, I watched that one in preparation for this. Uh, And don't forget, you also found Jimmy Hoffa's wallet in that episode, which was a reference that went way over my head as a kid. Yeah, I know. Same here. Yeah, I think it went most people's Same here. Same here. That was just like, I was like, Jimmy Hoffa, who? Yeah, because nine-year-olds know about crime lords. Um, and then, you know, following, um, you know, all the other episodes, like, the one episode that really got me scratching my head is, like, how did they put this on was the episode Field of Pete. Now, it looks normal. It's about baseball. But then they introduce Orange Lazarus, which is basically like a 7-Eleven smoothie drink that when you drink it, it's like your mind is all in calm and control. But then in the end, when they cranked it up to, like, extra super cold... Everybody's, like, going through, like, the most massive brain freeze, and it looks, like, really disorienting and dizzy. Almost like they're hinting at something. Well, yes. You gotta love the, you gotta love the ways they try to work in their work around censorship laws to deal with, you know, to deal with concepts like kids getting high. Right. In fact, I've read, um, I've, I know about the, um, the 20th anniversary uh, Pete and Pete reunion that happened not too long ago, that they actually did serve Orange Lazarus for both the kids and for the adults, and for the adults, they had, like, a shot of vodka in it. So what, what were the, uh, what were they, were they just, like, uh, Orange Julius that had been diluted or something? Or? Yeah, that's pretty much it. It's just basically Orange Julius. It's funny you should say that, because the one episode that surprises me that it got on the air that, uh, is when Pete is when Big Pete joins the wrestling team, and I'm gonna I'm gonna 
admit this now. That episode, I actually found it kind of disturbing as a kid because they, they kind of skirt around this fact, but the idea is pretty clear that Endless Mike is murdering the other players to get to Pete. Oh, my God. I'm so, no, not to cut you off, Alex. I thought the same thing. I thought the same thing, man. That was... Oh, God. Yeah, I, I don't understand how they were able to get away with this because, to be quite honest, when it comes to the majority of the bullies that were introduced, Endless Mike was the most interesting, to say the least. One minute he's a bully, the next minute he's a nice guy, so it's like, you know, he's always mixing his personalities. I think he just has r multiple personality disorder, to say the least. Or he hasn't taken his medicine. Mm. Anybody remember the scene uh, where he had that skull face painted? Yeah, that episode? Yeah, that was the same episode. Yeah, that was creepy. For me, it's kind of like how I... That episode kind of reminded me of how I would feel watching Tim Burton's Batman as a kid when the Joker murdered inc or incinerated that guy with the, with the joy buzzer. It's like, I'm disturbed, but at the same time, I kind of like being disturbed. <laughs> uh, I guess you could say that. Uh, you're supposed to walk that fine line between either disturbing or it's dark comedy. Uh -huh. Which, in itself, I think that, you know, Pete and Pete does have a fair share of dark comedy. But it did, there were definitely moments when it did kind of cross that line. Yeah, they did. I think maybe around the end of season two they definitely did, or the beginning of season three. I don't think a lot of people were watching it in 95 or 96, because that was when all that was featuring. And most people were watching that over Pete and Pete, so... I think they were able to get away just slightly a little bit more, because that was when they were... Uh, bringing it down to a child demographic. So they had to play it smart. Yeah, you gotta wonder why they did it, though. Was it just, like, a marketing thing? Did they see that, you know, did they think, oh, Little Pete is the popular one, let's focus more shows, let's focus more episodes on him, and try to basically make him the star of the show like they did with Steve Urkel on Family Matters? Um... I think, like I mentioned previously, the Nickelodeon Network, they felt that season two was just too weird for kids, and it was um, generating too much of a bigger audience, which, at this point, with all that becoming a popular show for kids, they wanted to have more shows that were featuring kids. I mean, after all, this is the number one kids network. So, also not to mention that Mike Morona was going through puberty, and that was when he was getting, like, too old to be featured in a lot of the Pete and Pete episodes. All right. So, um, anybody else have anything to say about Pete and Pete right before we go? Nick and I were actually talking about this earlier today, and I, was, and I thought about this a lot while I was watching the episodes, because I, I work in film, I'm, I'm an actor, I, uh, I've, I've actually been working on my own pilot lately, but... I I just find it interesting what a big production, when you really look at the show, what a big production that show really was, because, I mean, a lot of shows, even geared towards adults, were shows that just had, you know, people standing around one set talking to laugh tracks, but this was a show that had outdoor sets, dozens of extras... Yeah, definitely. I feel, um, you know, interestingly enough, The Adventures of Pete and Pete, out of all the Nickelodeon shows that she featured at the time, it was the one that had the lowest budget. They didn't have three cameras, they had like a single camera, and they, don't, they didn't film in Nickelodeon Studios, and they didn't have a laugh track. So they had to work with what they had. In fact, if you read the book Slimed, an oral history of Nickelodeon's Golden Age, a lot of the clothes that the characters were wearing were their actual clothes. Yeah, yeah, on my pilot, we did the same thing. Oh, also, they were talking about how the cinematography was different than all the other kids' shows at the time. It was a lot more grittier, and it was a lot more natural. So it had, like, a real genuine feel to Pete and Pete that most other shows at the time were not doing, or even today. It wasn't a show that really garnered a lot of popularity. I mean, overall, it had, like, a 2.1 million viewer rating, which, you know, in itself is not really that much. I mean, those kind of shows that get a 2 million rating, depending on, you know, which network, that's the kind of show that would get immediately canceled. I mean, you know, shows like All That and Keenan and Kel and a lot of the other shows that came out in the mid to late 90s, they were like the ones that made the huge amount of money. And they said that P&P may have been the last show that reached its golden age. Would you guys agree? Yeah. That reached its what? They say that Pete and Pete may have been the last show on Nickelodeon that was from the Golden Era. Would you agree, Alex? 
Uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember what else came out around that time, because uh, did, didn't uh, Keenan and Kel come after that? Yeah, that um, yeah, Keenan and Kel came out in 96, and a lot of the other live-action shows that came out were um, the, the Mystery Files of Shelby Wu, uh, 100 Deeds for Eddie McDowd, Cousin Skeeter, and um, The Amanda Show. Yeah, me, I, I don't know, maybe it's just when I... Maybe it's just when I was watching, but I kind of think of Keenan and Kel as a show that was in that golden age as well. But um, it, I don't know. My definition of a golden age may be different from theirs because I, I kind of think that's around the time. I think that what they meant by golden age was that, you know, it was when Nickelodeon was at a more simpler time where they didn't make a lot of money and they were not like the big conglomerate network that they are today. Because as I mentioned previously, Pete and Pete ran on a low budget. They hit it well. Mm hmm. They did. They did hide it really well. Even though they had like one single camera, as opposed to the traditional three cameras that would be shot in a typical sitcom, and also they didn't have a lot of, um, you know, stage uh, sets. Not to mention that a lot of them were basically outdoors, which is actually a huge plus, since most sitcoms nowadays mostly take place indoors, and most of the outdoor settings are fake. More with less. Yeah, that is definitely so. There's another example about a show that was basically running on a similar low budget, but it definitely shows how bad the budget is, and that is uh, Space Cases. Oh, You guys remember Space Cases? I remember watching it, but it's been a long time since I've watched it. I've seen a few reruns, and when your set design looks worse than the set design on Mystery Science Theater, uh, pre-sci-fi Mystery Science Theater, you know you've got problems. <laughs> I was going to say, I watched it, but I, it's been a long time, so I really don't have a lot to say about it. Yeah. So, um, overall, uh, would you say that the show still holds up, and would you recommend it to people? Definitely. Especially the episodes with Adam West, because they are absolutely brilliant. Yeah, that's right. Adam West was uh, appeared in a couple of episodes. Uh, what about you, Alex? Would you recommend this show? Oh, I would definitely recommend it, and it definitely holds up. I, I think it... You know, it it was a it was a funny kid show, and it's one of the few shows that really gets better watching it again as an adult. I mean, I get more of the jokes, I appreciate more things. I I look back at how I think it better captures growing up than a lot of other shows that are supposedly about growing up. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Kevin, what do you say? I totally agree that it definitely holds up, and I definitely would recommend it to people. Yeah, I would say the exact same thing. If you want to be able to break the mold of what a typical sitcom from Nickelodeon or the Disney Channel is, I would recommend watching The Adventures of Pete and Pete. It just has that quirky charm that most uh, live-action shows don't even have today. All right, so I think that we can be able to conclude this episode. Do you guys have anything to plug or promote right before we go? I'm I booked for a stand-up show on Saturday, though. I'm trying to reschedule. It's in Cleveland, so I don't know how many people would really be able to come anyway still working on editing my pilot but i really don't have uh i i still don't know when i'll actually be able to finish that and uh what is the name of your pilot by the way pinheads pinheads fan page on facebook liam's in it oh nice yes um liam liam higgins who is mr aspiring actor from manic expression yeah it's fun it's funny uh one of the actresses in my pilot actually thought we were related (laughs) yeah that's kind of funny because, uh, no offense, but you and Liam do not look anything alike. One of my friends said said he thinks Liam looks like Matt Dillon. Really? Mm-hmm. Hmm. Probably because of the hair. God, and you look like Matt Dillon? No, nothing like it. Jim, do you have anything to promote right before we go? Um, uh, well, with the upcoming 50th anniversary of Doctor Who, I'll be, uh, getting up my thoughts on the Big Finish audio play to commemorate the event to the light at the end and I'm also working on getting my very long overdue review of Grand Theft Auto 5 up before November's over okay great um and uh, Kevin and I were still working on um, a couple of other things. We'll be doing a couple of more podcasts right before the year's over. We're going to be doing an episode of Turtle Talk, uh, an episode of Nick Jukebox dedicating to the soundtrack of Pete and Pete. will be up around Thanksgiving, which is on the day that Pete and Pete aired. 
as well as um, Kevin and I, we'll be doing a few podcasts for casual chats before this year's over. And one of them, if you've been looking on our Facebook page, it includes Dr. Morgus, which Kevin is ecstatic gone. Well, Patty's also ecstatic, too, about it. She's, she's, she enjoys the good doctor. If you want to say so, I suppose. I guess that concludes this episode. So, um, Jim, uh, Alex, thank you so much for coming on by to Casual Chat. So we hope to catch you around soon. You're welcome, sir. My brother couldn't stay longer. Hey, guys. Thank you for coming. No You're problem. Welcome. Thank you for having us. Yes, well, right. we'll, we'll definitely want to have you uh, again in a future podcast. Thanks. I look forward to it. All right, so that concludes this episode of Casual Chats, and we will hope to see you in the next one. So, bye-bye. Later. Bye. Summer, baby, come on, baby, show me the town. I didn't know that you'd be such a short visit. Once a year I noticed that you're not around. Mama says you win. Like you, Wolfgang.